my name is Andrew Hanro. I am the project manager for the software team of Aether Engineering. Uh, to the left of me is the software team, uh, first is Lionel, then Bilal, Luis, and Patrick. And good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremy. I've had the pleasure of being the project manager for the hardware team. To my right is some awesome engineers. We've got Juan, who did, who's my charging and systems engineer. We've got Aaron, who's my digital systems, or we can call it electronic systems engineer. We have Eric, who's my RF or analog front end system engineer. We have John, who's my power and regulation engineer. And we have Zach, who's my sensors and systems engineer. I'm excited to bring this to you from Aether Engineering. We teamed up with Wind River Systems to answer a question. The problem is, is in the medical industry, we're dealing with a possible $4.78 trillion problem. What is that? Too many people, too many uh, waiting rooms that are full with individuals coming in for what they call maintenance type items. That's checking your heart rate, getting your physical, finding out what your vitals are. So we thought about it and when Rin River Systems came to us and said, you're the best engineering company I know in California, we took it on and said what we'd like to do is to leverage Wind River system, their Helix Cloud device, and the Internet of Things to take us from this to where we all thought we'd be quite a few years ago. That gives us the opportunity to create a suite, a system of systems, and our first one is the SoundScope, which is a Bluetooth connected stethoscope that also takes the genius of our software team to link us with an actual physician to give us feedback instead of a Fitbit that just tells us that we have a heart rate. I'd like to hand it off to Lionel to go over the user experience. Morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'm going to take you briefly through our implementation and what the standard user experience with our product will look like. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of how the product's going to work, uh, our hardware will generate a the the heartbeat signal sound recording, which will get passed to our Android application, which will then be uploaded to the cloud. And eventually, at the end, the physician will be able to use a custom Aether Medical Solutions website to be able to listen to your heart recording. Okay, so to go through a typical user experience, there's one of two ways that you could receive the product, either directly from your doctor during an office visit or at any time through the mail. Once you have the product, it's going to come with a set of instructions that uh, will let you know how to download and install on your Android device or custom application. Once you've installed our application, your experience will look a little bit like this. Uh, you'll have a pair of earbuds plugged into the device, and then you'll be able to use your smartphone to manipulate your playback, recording, and upload um, controls for the audio. So to go quickly, just briefly through what the application experience will be like. This is what you'll see on your phone when you start the application, standard login screen. Uh, but the one thing to note here is that for your user ID, we will be taking the patient's email address. We'll be logging that and along with the sound recording, that will be uploaded to the cloud and is how your physician will be able to automate contact with you to uh, give you your results once he has a chance to listen to your audio sample. After you've logged in, this is the first screen that you'll see. We've tried to stick to a very, very simple UI so it will not be technically intimidating for anybody of any age group or technical experience. We try to keep the application approachable to as many potential patients as possible. And you'll see that over half of the uh, user interaction with the application occurs with this single button on the main screen. When you first log in, the device will not be playing any audio. This is a chance to give the user uh, time to get in their earbuds, get comfortable, and not be wasting battery life on the portable device by streaming audio when no one will be able to listen to it. Once they're all set and they have their earbuds in, they'll press the main button, and this will now start streaming audio. So they'll be able to hear what the device is broadcasting, and this will give them the opportunity to change the position of the device on their chest, find the best quality signal that they can. Once they've found that, they'll press the button again, and this will actually start a 12-second countdown timer where we're now recording the audio that's coming from the device. Once that 12 seconds is up, they'll be automatically taken to this screen for playback and upload, and they have three options here. First is playback. Uh, this will start playing back the 12-second uh, audio sample, and it also has a visualizer and a standard playback bar where they'll be able to jump back and forth if you need to go back and listen to any uh, portion of the recording works like any kind of iTunes standard media uh, playback control. Uh, if you're not satisfied with the quality of the recording, 
simply hit the bottom button and it will take you back to the previous set of slides. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to make a new sample. Uh, and once you've gotten one that you're uh, satisfied with, hit the upload button, it'll go off to the Wind River uh, Helix Cloud, at which point it'll be accessible by your doctor uh, from our custom website, which Dalal will now talk to you about um, what the physician's experience on the other side of the process will be like. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dalal. I'm going to go over our website here. So our website consists of three parts. Um, the first part, which is on the left side where it says online patient, is where we have our uh, patients listed. Our patients are uh, uploaded directly from or automatically from our cloud. Um, the, the physician would be able to navigate through that list that we have there and easily choose a patient. Once that is selected, we can, uh, that takes us to the middle part of our website where it says patient information. So we're gonna have a detailed uh, description of the patient information from their names, address, uh, gender, date of birth, et cetera. Um, also, I'd like to mention that the part underneath that um, is our um, future project. So we were so for any future um, addition to our project, we will um, keep in mind adding blood pressure and temperature and also heart rate. Now, after um, the physician chooses um, the specific patient, uh, they would be able to play their heart uh, heartbeats. We have the player on the last part of our website on the right right side. So once that heart uh, beat is played for the convenience of both the patient and the physician, um, they, the, uh, the physician would be able to write a brief uh, message. The message can be sent um, directly to the patient. It would be received as an email notification. Um, next, I'm gonna hand it to Jeremy to go over the hardware. Thank you, Paul. Again, I'm the project manager for the hardware team, and the distinct thing that I was able to challenge our group with, which they all hit a home run, is to make a final product. So part of that is designing an actual case. This is a 3D printed view of our case for our product. And in order to have a case, you need to have something to put into it. And that's why we have a finalized board made for ether engineering using our inductive charging system, the case, the sensor front end, the cradle, everything in one nice neat little package. In order to get here, we had to go through many stages in engineering as we all know. We had to make a, a couple learning lessons and I'd like to bring each engineer up to talk about the specific area on which they worked. And Zach's gonna be the first one. He's my sensors and front end collection engineer. Thanks, Jeremy. My name is Zach, I've been working on sensor design this semester. So before we talk about our solution, let's take a brief look at stethoscope design over the years. Uh, so while the details have changed, the basic concept has not, and that is to use a long hollow tube placed against the patient's body to carry sound waves to the doctor's ear. So one of our goals with this project was to keep the capabilities of a traditional standard stethoscope and also improve upon it in two different ways. We wanted to filter out unwanted noise, unwanted frequencies, as well as amplify any sounds. And this led us to two different sensors and two different interchangeable sensor heads to use on our device. The first one uses a piezoelectric disc and that material responds entirely to mechanical uh, vibration and displacement to create a varying output. And so that sensor head would be ideal for a noisy environments such as a trade show or design day, and is also good for detecting pulse, and it, it can be, be, it's better for placing over the patient's uh, clothing if needed. And our second sensor head uses a small electret microfo microphone that's attached to a standard acoustic stethoscope head. And that sensor is ideal for in-home patient use where the patient can be in a quiet setting and also this sensor head is designed more for placing, being placed directly against the patient's skin. And so to talk more about our amplification and filtering capabilities, Eric. Exactly. So I was in charge of the pulse shaping portion of this circuit and the pulse shaper consists of an amplifying stage and a filtering stage. So for our amplifying stage, we had to have a high impedance input to match with the high impedance output from the sensors that, that, that uh, Zach just discussed. Uh, we are also operating off of a single-ended power supply. Because the battery that we're using only has positive voltage range, our op amps could only operate in that positive voltage swing. 
So the signal coming in from the sensors had to be DC biased to be able to run through our, our, our op amp network. Also, we wanted to provide a differential signal into our RN52 Bluetooth module. Uh, the purpose for the differential signal is it's going to give us the cleanest, highest fidelity signal for the Bluetooth module to actually transmit. And this uh, photo up at the top shows that differential signal. That signal was uh, created just using a function generator, but it, it uh, shows that we're actually getting a differential signal from the uh, Paul shaping network. For our low-pass filter, we use the second-order Butterworth. This is giving us a, approximately a 5 dB per decade uh, at, uh, after the uh, cutoff frequency, and our cutoff frequency is at 1090 hertz. Uh, this is a schematic of the Paul shaping network. Uh, the key features here are that we have our, our amplification stage, our filtering stage, and our, uh, our differential signal stage. I'm now going to pass this off to Mr. Backer, who will now discuss power supplies. Okay. Morning, my name is John Backer, and I designed a power supply for our stethoscope. Uh, so one of the things we had to take into consideration is we had a portable handheld device, completely wireless, so it's a natural choice to go with the battery. Um, we chose a 3.7 volt lithium polymer battery at rated at 300 mAh. Uh, one of the primary design decisions for using this particular battery is uh, commercial availability, extreme low cost, they're only a couple dollars each. They're very lightweight, but most importantly for our design is we needed a customizable form factor. The actual handheld stethoscope case had limited space inside for the battery, so we needed to have capability to choose the exact size and shape of the battery to fit our uh, project goals. Um, our overall system draws about 65 milliamps under typical load, and with this battery, this gives us approximately two hours of battery life. On the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the actual power supply circuit that we implemented on the PCB. So we wanted to go with as simple as possible and still meet our design goals. So what we have here is a voltage regulator. It's a 3.3 volt low dropout voltage regulator. The battery tied directly to the input of the regulator and the regulator outputs clean <coughs> filter 3.3 for all of our ICs. Next, I'll pass it off to Juan who will discuss our battery charge management. Thank you, John. Good morning, my name is Juan Rodriguez and today I'll be discussing the battery charging management system. When I first started to design the system, I was focused on one key parameter that our sponsor said. Our device needs to be able to expand into not only hospitals and clinics, besides just home use. We know that most hospitals, what they would like would be a device that they can be easily washed, cleaned, you know, to remove germs, and so on and so forth. But how do we accomplish this? this? This should be a hermetically sealed device for a hospital. We can't do that if we have conventional charging with wires, cables, and all that. So we decided to go with inductive charging. As you can see, the coils right here, and we have a Coulomb counter and battery management chip. So with a 9-volt input, that gave us, with a turn ratio, that gave us a 5-volt output at our at our device. With that 5 volt output going through the battery charge management chip, we can easily control the current. Why would we want to control the current? Well, our sponsor could easily change the size of the battery depending on what, what daily use, whether they decide, oh, we're going to use the, the, the device more than just 20 minutes a day, we might want a bigger battery. Also, they could change how fast the battery will charge in the device. All easily done by changing one resistor. If we talk after, after this uh, battery management chip, we go through the Coulomb counter. Why do we need a Coulomb counter? Well, a, a typical lithium ion battery will state a 3.7 volt or depending 3.8, whatever it is. In our case, it's 3.7. Normally, we cannot accurately measure the voltage across that battery. So, with a Coulomb counter, we can count Coulombs and counting those coulombs, we could, uh, we could tell the PIC microcontroller what our actual battery state is. We can see from this graph that a voltage might start at 4.2 and, and it will stay typically around 3.7 volts. We know it's not going to stay at all times at 3.7, so if we can count with the coulomb counter a full charge, full charge battery and a full discharge, we can actually know exactly what state our battery is in. Is it full? Is it halfway? Is it, does it need to be charged? To go further into that, we'll let Aaron get into that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron, and I was in charge of the microcontroller integration into our system. Uh, as you heard from Lionel and saw from the pictures of our app, 
Uh, we wanted to keep the user interface software as simplistic as possible. Uh, that same less is more mentality carried over to the hardware team. And in an effort to keep all the user functionality solely on the app, we decided to incorporate a PIC16 microcontroller. Uh, incorporating the PIC16 microcontroller reduces user complexity, also allows us to reduce the number of components on our system, i.e. we don't have any buttons or charging cables. It's also capable of making real-time decisions for the user based off of predetermined functions and algorithms. Uh, one of those said functions is shown in this video. It's for our analog accelerometer. Uh, it allows the device to automatically turn on when it reaches a threshold, when it's picked up, and it'll automatically shut down after a short period of inactivity. Ours is set for about 20 seconds here, I believe. The PIC microcontroller is also uh, monitoring the Bluetooth communication between the app and the RN52. Uh, by eavesdropping on that communication, we're allowed to communicate with the RN52 through a UART and take commands from the phone and physically implement them onto the hardware. Some of those commands would be adjusting the gain and powering down the device. Uh, the last thing it does is, as Juan alluded to, it's aiding in the battery charging system. It'll be counting the coulombs from the coulomb counter, keeping track of that, and also uh, judging the polarity on that pin. That'll let us know if the battery is charging or it's discharging. It'll also give us an accurate representation of the exact battery level at all times. With that information, we relay it to the app, uh, identifying to the user the exact battery levels and also alerting them when the battery is in a critical condition and needs to be placed back on the charging uh, cradle. The bottom line is, while the device is in operation, the microcontroller is constantly monitoring all the circuitry and, re and all information being relayed from the app. Uh, it's hard at work, so the user doesn't have to be. Uh, that wraps it up for the hardware. I'm going to hand it over to Luis and the software team now. Thank you, Eric. Good morning. My name is Luis, and I'm going to give you an overview of how we went about and, and, and implemented our Bluetooth so that the app can talk to the R52, which is in, uh, in the device. So we have a Bluetooth routine that we had to follow and is provided to us by the Android libraries. We start with the local Bluetooth adapter. This adapter is located already inside the, uh, <coughs> the phone or tablet that is running our app and that allows us to start scanning, uh, allows us to go into discovery mode and query a, a list of paired devices. Once we locate the RM52 and we know that that's the device that we want to connect to, we open a Bluetooth server socket. This open in, opens uh, a line to here, the incoming device, so that it tells us that it's very ready to pair. Once it's ready to pair, we <coughs> it sends back a Bluetooth socket, which is similar to the TCP, the internet's TCP, which handles the, uh, the transport of packets. Uh, once we have a successful connection, we have to install the correct Bluetooth profiles and protocols so that we are able to handle the way the device handles easy for use for the uh, user. We first use a HFP, which is the hands-free protocol. This is an audio gateway that allows audio to transfer both ways from the device to the app. Uh, <coughs> it also allows us to control some of the uh, device's functionality with the actual physical buttons of the, t of the phone or tablet. We then uh, applied HSP, which is the uh, <coughs> headset profile. This relies uh, solemnly on the SEO connection, which is synchronized connected oriented links it uh, allows us to control that audio that is traveling, either stop it or, stop or start it, either where we want, whether we want sound inside the app or where we, whether we want sound in the device. And then we then apply the SPP profile, which is the serial communication uh, profile, which Andrew will talk to you more about. So we use the SPP profile to set up a bi-directional communication so that the application can send commands to the device. Uh, we set up four commands, three of which the user controls. Uh, one will increase the gain if this button is uh, pressed. If this button is pressed, it will decrease the gain, and this button will restart the device. Uh, additionally, inside the application, there is an automatic battery request set up. So every five minutes, it'll send a request for the battery level and update the uh, graphic on the device screen. If an A is received, a uh, full battery will be uh, displayed. Uh, if B is received, two thirds. If C is received, one third. And if D is received, critical battery level will be displayed. <laughs> Up next, we'll be talking about uh, cloud and web page. Pass it off to Patrick. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Patrick. I was in charge of the 
cloud integration for the software team. So the system we've been using this semester is called the Wind River Helix Device Cloud. Um, it's an online database for your IoT connected uh, devices uh, to increase operational awareness and intelligence. So with information being passed instantly to you, you'll be able to make better business decisions. Um, why we chose this? We needed three key things. We wanted to connect and transfer securely to a remote server. We wanted to manage and analyze the data that we put up. And finally, we wanted to build systems and applications with that posted data. Uh, next, I'll show you a workflow of it. So our devices and things, which is our stethoscope and our microcontrollers, are sending data to the cloud uh, via middleware, which is software that connects two different applications. And before it hits uh, the cloud, it goes through a gateway, which is our Android device. And this points to on-demand uh, on infrastructure to protect user data and uh, applications. Finally, once on the cloud, we're able to monitor and configure, as well as query data in the same fashion our website does. So this is a brief overview of the cloud. I'll pass it off to Jeremy to talk about achievements. All right, for us, we, we set ourselves apart a little bit this year by having some pretty amazing achievements. Uh, one of the things when Wind River Systems offered us the largest contract we could possibly have is because we were gonna create a device that there was only one that was just patented this semester, and it, it's not even as cool as ours. So um, the fact that we did that without anything to base it off of, I'm, I'm extremely proud of these guys. Also, we combined two senior design projects into one. So we did the inductive charging along with the Bluetooth stethoscope. Uh, I wanted to make it hover in midair, but we only had a week left. So we were gonna try to do that as well. The other thing is, is we completed our project two weeks under this week, so we were two weeks ahead and under budget. And also the software team was able to make it an open-ended design to allow for continued development, along with our hardware package, because the only difference between a blood pressure cuff, a thermometer, is your sensor you're putting into it. We have a board that's just processing as signal. So it's totally expandable into whatever suite you want to use. The final thing is the budget. Uh, we ended up $2,000 under budget. Uh, we were given $3,500 to start, um, and we thought that would be a great parting gift to give to San Diego State one last time, is uh, to make sure that we were able to give them more money. So we did that by shaving off our budget quite a bit. But here's the awesome thing. In order to produce these, we can produce them at a cost of $36.50. With 150% markup, you're gonna be in the hundreds of dollars to sell these units. Not only with that, you can sell the software packages and the suites and the leverage that Wind River Systems and Intel provide you to create more software suites and packages to give to the customer, therefore increasing your total net profit. Our prototype cost to produce was $1,500, and that's because we were going through and developing a product through IRAD, DVT, things like that. But we're planning on doing our first Elbert production at 10,000 units, and at 10,000 units, we can do them at $36.50 a piece. And with that, I wanna thank all of you for coming. I know that you're all gonna be at Design Day on Friday to witness the amazingness of a stethoscope that transmits to a phone and sends it to the software package but to also see OMIS and the other teams that have worked extremely hard this semester. And I'd like to thank all the seniors that are graduating. I'd like to thank all the guys on my team. And we're done. Thank you. Thanks.